All right, let's begin. So we're going to talk about something new today, loops 1.4, rational expressions. Some expressions are irrational, crazy, others are very, that's not points. Rational, root word is ratio, it means we're looking at uh, things that are expressed as divisions. So, define uh, irrational expression. Is one of the form. x over q of x. And remember that uh, we can never divide by 0, so it's always assumed that q cannot be 0. That will uh, be one of the um, <coughs> things you have to worry about when you're looking at the domain of a rational expression, for example. And just a note here, uh, a function, <coughs> we'll talk about functions soon, but I think everyone kind of already knows what it is. If they look at uh, Say f of x equals p over x <coughs> is called a rational function when p and q are polynomials. So while we can, in theory, kind of divide things that are not polynomials, usually the, the phrase rational function, whenever some, some, someone says, we're looking at a rational function, they're always uh, assuming that these two are polynomials. If they're not polynomials, you might call it an algebraic function or something like that. Uh, but the rational expression, the term expression, is, is more general. These P and Q, they can be anything. They can be made up of any of those. Remember those six functions I told you that were like the infinity stones? Yeah, those guys. You can combine them in any way using arithmetic and composition, and then divide two of these things, and you create what's called a rational expression. Rational functions usually reserved for when these guys are polynomials. Now, again, q of x is not zero. Uh, one thing I want to talk about, domain of a rational expression. The domain of a rational expression. <laughs> Now, this uh, can be tricky depending on what functions are involved, but there is a nice rule of thumb that you can go by. The domain of p of x over q of x. What this is going to be, uh, it's going to be a couple uh, of things. Uh, it is going to be, one, the set of all x in the domain of p. So you have to figure out what is the domain of the top function intersected with the set of all x in the domain of q. You're going to figure out what is the domain of the bottom function intersected with more specifically the x uh, in domain q, where q of x is not 0. So that's basically to say whenever we're looking for the domain of a rational expression, we have to focus on three things. Where does the top function work? Where does the bottom function work? And where is the bottom function not 0, right? Outputting 0 does mean technically it works. You can't divide by zero, so since the Q of X is in the denominator, you cannot actually uh, have a zero <coughs> output being a thing. Now, for rational functions and remember when I say rational function, I'm talking about P, Q, or polynomials. Uh, we only worry about Q of x, not equal to zero. 
Why? Because polynomials work everywhere. So this will be everything, and that will be everything, and so you only have to worry about this. Okay. Uh, since I did ask about domains on the last quiz, we've done it like three or so times now, and I'm going to ask you, we're going to go over another domain question, and you guys can actually probably lead me through it. That'll be good. Then we'll get to the really uh, interesting stuff. But knowing where the function works is, of course, very important. Just two simple examples here. similar to the quiz, just in case you're wondering where my answers come from. So I believe there was one point in the quiz where I said, uh, what is the domain of, it was 9 minus x squared, but I also believe that asked, let's do a little different one, 4 minus x squared plus x to the minus 1 over 4. Here, that was a quiz. So let's actually see uh, how to actually do that. And as well as do all of these. strategies in terms of principles. <laughs> so really don't really just jump to an x value that you see is not going to work. Really think about the principle that you want to abide by here. Um, since uh, this is a rational function, what you really want to worry about is where the denominator is not zero. So that's the first thing that you should take. I want x squared minus 1 to not be 0, right? Think like that. Don't think in terms of isolated x values, because it's pretty easy to miss one. In fact, one was missed, which is why I'm bringing this up. Now, knowing that this is what I don't want, how do I actually figure that out what x is for? Yeah, how would you solve that equation? Plus 1, both sides. Here's what I'd rather you do. In general, unless something is an x to the 1, I'd rather you try to factor. Okay. That's a difference of squares, right? We spoke about that last time. So either x equals 1, which everybody mentioned, but everyone forgot minus 1, right? <laughs> so be careful. <coughs> so it turns out that you cannot have x equals 1 or minus 1 because both of those will actually make this zero. Um, we'll actually talk about equations again. I know everyone kind of knows it, but I'm going to talk about some general principles so you don't end up in a situation that we just ended up with, not remembering that there was another guy there. Um, and one of the general principles is, unless it's linear, you tend to want to factor <laughs> in order to solve your equations. We'll deal with that. We'll talk about that soon. That's a general principle. Uh, so we know how to draw this on the number line. Uh, this means minus 1 and plus 1. You cannot be those guys, so they are left unshaded, and you can shade them here. Now, for this, strictly speaking, we don't need this picture, but the picture is going to be very important for the other two, so I just want us to get a little bit of practice here. So we can be anything except those two numbers. Now, how do you express that as uh, a in, in interval notation? So, let me call this p of x, q of x. So, in other words, the domain of P of X in interval numbers <laughs> are that one. It's 
actually a very common mistake for students to forget this middle part. Right? They go up to negative one and they start from one to go back. I don't know why, but oftentimes, psychologically, for some reason, they forget to write on the middle point, which is another reason why graphing actually helps you. When you shade this, you know that there are three things you should be writing down. There's three shaded regions. There's one region from negative infinity to negative one. Between here is negative one to one. And from here is one to infinity. Um, and I can just tell you from experience, uh, students often forget this part. So that's another reason why it's nice. Just draw a little picture of shade in where you should be so you don't forget anything. Again, be careful how you're solving equations so you don't forget anything. And just make sure you have one of these sets of parentheses and or mixture of brackets for each shaded region that actually works for the thing you're looking at. So this has three parts and that's the domain. Any questions? to zero. However, because we know we don't want the zero, uh, you should ignore the equal to part. But in general, if it's a radical, you, you want it to be greater than or equal to zero. The equal is just a bad thing here because this guy has to be denominator. And? Right, you need one minus x to be greater than or equal to zero. So, we kind of did it backwards in the way that I wrote it, but it doesn't matter. We need to find the sets where the bottom is not zero, and the bottom is going to work, and the top is going to work. So we look at three parts. Where does this work, where does that work, and where's the bottom not zero? Okay, so that's the general principle for, for a radical expression. Now, of course, deal with one at a time. Uh, this would mean, of course, you can square both sides. This means that one minus x squared should not be zero. In factor, that's the difference of squares. So you know that x cannot be 3 or x cannot be minus 3. And what this would look like is this guy. It can be anything except those two points. Now we move over here, and you want 9 minus x squared to be greater than 0. Now, as we'll discuss with inequalities, you pretty much treat them like equal signs except in like three scenarios, which when we deal with inequalities, I'll tell you what those are. So I'll pretend this is an equal sign, just as before, I'm gonna factor. So I end up with test points x equals three, x equals minus three. I'm going to plot those on the number line as before, but now I want to actually test where I get something greater than zero. So plug in random numbers, like a minus four, like a zero, and like a four. Make them nice numbers, whole numbers that you can do calculations easy with. So technically you could have picked minus 1729.6, and this process would still work, but why would you use minus 1729.6, right? Use a nice number, minus four. So notice here, if I plug minus four into the factor form, I would have three minus a minus four, this would be positive, 3 minus 4, that would be negative. Positive times negative, right? So here I get a positive times a negative, which is negative. So what that means is, oh, that's bad, right? It does not work here. If I plug in a 0, plug in 0 for x here, I get 3, which is positive. Plug in 0 for x here, I get 3, which is positive. So here I have a positive times a positive, which is positive. So here it does work. And if I plug in a 4, this is going to be negative, that is going to be positive, so I have a negative times a positive, which overall is a negative, which means that this does not work. So for this region, here is where the answer is supposed to be. Do the same thing over here. Now this is linear, so this is where you can kind of follow your knee-jerk reaction to move this over to the other side. So the power of x is 1. So now you want your x less, uh, less than or equal to 1. 
or one is greater than or equal to x, it's the same saying x is less than or equal to one. So here there's this one point. Uh, this can be shaded though because we can be equal to, and I want to be less than or equal to one. So over here. Okay, so now how do you find the domain of the entire function? Well, you look for the intersect or the overlap. So what you do is, um, and this is what I do, is that especially if uh, you're not well versed in doing these things, you put in all the th numbers that apply. So there was a minus 3 and a 3. There was uh, also a 1. And then I'll actually draw all these shaded regions over. So for one of the guys, uh, I need it to not be any of these, so all of that worked. For the last guy, I need it to be in between these. And for this one, I need it to be here or less. Right? And so now what you do is you find the overlap. Right? So where are all three lines present? Well, only two are present in this region, so that region is not going to be where the answer is. So that's not going to work. If I look over here, only one of them is over here. That doesn't work. Uh, look in this region, only two of them are here, so that doesn't work. So it means our answer is here, right? Where all three will work. Both the top will work, the bottom will work, and the bottom won't be zero all at the same time. This is going to be the intersection. So how do I write that? I think I can use that for case key. In interval notation. So that's in general for a rational expression. Figure out where the top works, where the bottom works, and where the bottom is not zero, and overlap. Uh, that will be the region where uh, your function in its entirety is going to work. Now, can be this isn't a rational expression, but since we're playing this game, we might as well look at one of the quiz problems. we actually rewrite the x to the minus 1 fourth. 1 over x to the 1 fourth. Um, another way to actually imagine that, uh, to be a little bit suggestive, how can I rewrite x to the 1 fourth? Okay, so that is the situation. Now, writing it with the radicals, it doesn't really change anything. It just it visually gives me some cues that I can go by. Because I have radicals where there's a 2 here and there's a 4 here, I need what's underneath the radicals to be greater than or equal to And for this one in particular, I need the uh, x to be larger than 0. So again, I deal with these one at a time. For this guy, I need 4 minus x squared to be greater than or equal to 0. This would factor into 2 minus x and 2 plus x greater than or equal to 0. So I get to test x equals 2 and x equals minus 2. Drawing that on the number line. I can test points like minus 3, 0, and 3. Uh, plugging in minus 3 here gives me a positive. There it gives me a negative, so that's not going to work. Plugging in 0 here is a positive. 0 there is a positive, so that's going to work. Uh, and plugging in 3 here is going to give me a negative, there it's going to give me a positive, so that doesn't work. So only the middle works. By the way, let me just mention this really quickly. For, say, 4 minus x squared greater than or equal to 0, 
it happens to be an expression that uh, you should be able to graph easily. Could use the graph. Right? Like if you're graphing y equals 4 minus x squared, what does that actually look like? Upside down parabola. Uh, symmetric about the y axis. You will notice that this point is going to be what? Minus 2. This point here is going to be 2. And just by looking at the picture in your head, you can automatically see where it's positive. That's where it's above the horizontal. So you can tell it's going to be in the middle. Uh, if I were to ask the question, uh, where is, say, x squared minus 4 greater than or equal to 0, again, I can see this picture in my head, and then I know, oh, that's going to be on the outside. So I know it's going to be minus infinity uh, to minus 2, uh, union 2 to infinity. Right? So even without doing these calculations, I can kind of figure it out in, with expressions like these that I can graph easily. But if you can't graph easily, don't worry about it. Just treat it as an equation you're going to solve, figure out the values that you need to test, and just test them one by one. Um, for this one, what do we need here? Uh, well, you need x greater than or equal to 0 uh, for the radical to work. That one's pretty uh, self-explanatory. Uh, it's 0 or bigger. And you need x not equal to 0 for the denominator to work. So you can't do that. So in other words, now you can just look at the overlap here, minus 2 to 2. We also have 0. We have one that can be 0 and bigger. We have one that can be anything except 0. We also have one that has to be between minus 2 and 2. And include it, right? Because it can be equal to. Look for the overlap of all of them. It's going to happen here. And again, you'll notice here that the domain of R of x. 0 cannot be included because that guy doesn't work. All the way up to 2, which everyone can include. So that was the answer there. I believe that was uh, version A. So you saw me right on that answer. That's how I, I figured it out. Any questions on that? Okay. Now, yeah. It's just place me with that so far, I'm sorry. Oh, because this is an even radical. Okay. So we saw last time uh, that the domain of anything that looks like the nth root of x there are three, well, two situations. It is going to be where x is greater than or equal to 0 if n is even. And it works for all x if n is odd. So here this was a 2. Here this was a 4. These guys are even. So greater than or uh, what's underneath the radical must be greater than or equal to 0 automatically okay. because of this rule. Um, there was an additional rule that applied here because it was actually in a denominator. So not only is it a radical, it's a rational expression. So that means I have to worry about division by zero. So being equal to zero didn't work either. So I had to make sure to get rid of that. <coughs> Check all the overlap for all the scenarios. And yeah, there you go. So remember when I was talking about uh, when you're studying how, I forgot what, what uh, tenant it was, but memorize the formulas exactly. It includes things like these. You should know basic properties of all the functions. Where's the domain of this? What's, where is it going to work? Where is it not going to work? And that will kind of lead you into what you, you should be doing. And then knowing that, oh, for something like a rational expression, you need the intersection of all these domains. It also tells you that you're looking for overlaps. A lot of times, just not knowing what you can do will get you in trouble. So we can move on.
Now what we're going to do, which is something that is very important, very useful, is going to be how to simplify irrational expressions. Um, and I'm going to go through several uh, different situations that you will encounter. But as I would say, a general strategy here, if I give you some things with rational expressions and I ask you to simplify them, um, probably what you'd want to do is one, you're going to combine them. And so if I give you several rational expressions, I say simplify this expression. Chances are at some point you're going to want to add them all together and then start working on it. And two, you're going to factor. That's very important. Factor and cancel common factors. And what I would also recommend is that check if this works for individual terms before combining. So that should be your general uh, sense of approach. There might be a few cases that are different, but by and large, uh, with these two approaches, you're going to be uh, simplifying rational expressions. We looked at factoring in detail, and so that shouldn't be bad. In terms of the combining operations, well, rational expressions, they look like fractions. It turns out that all the rules that we learned about fractions actually apply, so that's an important thing for you to do. So that means if I'm multiplying two rational expressions, you multiply the tops, then multiply the bottoms. If I'm trying to add them, you can do that cross multiplication thing. So we know that A over B plus C over D is equal to AD plus BC over BD. That still applies, right? All those rules that I spoke about still apply. So there's no other rules I need to teach you per se. I just need to teach you how to apply these rules in various situations. And that would help you out on like the problems that was on the homework that I kept getting asked about, and it will help out a lot of people actually. Like, I have my kids in Calc one and two still having trouble with this idea. They they'll, they'll try to expand things at, at times where I'm like, why are you expanding when you should be factoring? You're literally doing the opposite of what you should be doing, right? So if you see this complicated rational expression, your first thought should not be to expand everything. You want to be contracting everything. You want to write things as products because that allows you to cancel things in the top and the bottom, and you can only cancel across products. You cannot cancel across sums. So start expanding everything. It's putting you at a disadvantageous situation, right? You want to simplify something that's a division of two things. You want to factor each thing, right? That should be your first thought. So when we had that thing that I, I mentioned the other day, you know, that, that A minus 1 to the fourth and B plus one to the fourth, and some students started just factoring things out, that you shouldn't be thinking they started expanding things. You shouldn't be thinking expanding, you should be thinking factoring, right? There are various situations where expanding is the thing to do, various situations where factoring is the thing to do. This is one of the situations where factoring is the thing to do. It also tends to be, factoring also tends to be the thing you want to do when you're trying to solve equations. So this just should just be some, uh, give you some general insights, a kind of general knee-jerk reaction that you should be having. It's kind of the first thoughts you should be having. Can I factor and cancel anything and then combine and factor and cancel again? That's what you should be thinking. Any expansion that goes on, it should be thought of as a temporary strategy so that you can factor later, right? Sometimes you might end up in that situation where you can't really factor it as is, so what you do is you might expand a little part over here so that things can cancel so that you can refactor. But factoring is always what you're thinking. That's always the main goal. Okay? So you, you, when you want to simplify a rational expression, think factor. When you think factor, 
think the general approach of factoring, first of all, for common terms. If there are two terms of difference of squares, difference of cubes, sum of cubes. There are three terms, try the AC method, or one of the trial and error. There are four terms, try factor by grouping. Once you factor, try to see if anything refactors. Every time you think about doing a certain thing, a list of strategies should come up in your head about it. Like that's kind of how you want to study. Right? So a lot of students, they will study, they try to get through the examples, they try to get through the homework, but they never actually look back at it and try to see what was the pattern here? What was the overall strategy? Sometimes I can give you a homework with like 20 problems in it, but it's really trying to teach you two strategies. Did you know what the two things it tried to teach you were? Right? The examples are just illustrations of the strategies. You really want to have the strategies in mind when you're studying. Okay? So that's the overall general strategy. We're going to think combine, factor, and cancel. That's kind of where we're living right now when we want to simplify rational expressions. Now, in each individual situation, the, how you apply these might be different. So I'm going to talk about some uh, individual situations that you might have done. And while you're doing this, just remember that all the rules that I told you about fractions still apply. I'm not going to go over them. Uh, we're just going to actually uh, do them. So well, let's just uh, start with multiplication of rational expressions. Division, then we're going to talk about addition and subtraction, then we're going to talk about rationalizing. Don't know how much of that I will get through today, but we will try to get through as much as possible. Like I said, the rules, I already taught you these. This was from the last lecture, this was from the, the, a couple lectures before that. So I'm just going to kind of jump into the examples and see what we can do right away. So, <coughs> through some of these where applicable I'll tell you about some uh, extra tips and tricks that you tend to want to look for. And we'll, we'll, uh, and we'll apply these tricks in more complicated situations. Once you know multiplication, you'll kind of automatically know division because to divide by a fraction, you just flip and multiply. So I'll give you even more complicated multiplication examples when we get there. Uh, but this is just uh, to warm up. <laughs> what we're doing. That's the example, simplify. <laughs> Specifically, what would you do? <laughs> well, we're going to simplify, yeah. It's the, t the section is simplifying right now. I know that's what we're doing. How? Simplify by cross multiply. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what do you mean cross multiply? Um, there are terms that you can, like, for 6 and 20, mm -hmm. 2 goes into 6 and into 20, so that's like a common factor. Yeah, 2 goes into this how many times? 3, yeah, 
we could do that. Uh, anything else? So this brings us to the first tip. new fractions, 1 third and 10 over 7. How do you multiply fractions? Well, you multiply the tops together and you multiply the bottoms together, right? So this is 10 over 21. Now I want to, to show you uh, another way that you could do this, of course, is some students, once they see that fraction, they immediately want to go into just applying the rule where they multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom, and sometimes they even simplify this in the process. So, another way. Maybe I should write this in red. Uh, because it's discouraged, it's not technically wrong, but I would discourage doing it this way because uh, students will tend to make mistakes. <laughs> so, they would see something like 5 over 6 times 20 over 35. And what they would do is they would multiply the 5 and the 20 to get 100. Then they'll multiply the 6 and the 35. And they'll actually calculate what this is in their head. What is 6 times 35? 210. And now they start the process of canceling across here, which you could cancel this and cancel this. And you would also get 10 over 21. Now, there is a potential problem here. This example is very simple, so we didn't get into too much trouble by doing that. But I do want you to be aware, if the numbers start getting bigger or the expressions start getting more complicated, doing this first can actually get you into trouble, even though technically it's not wrong. It's a potential problem here. Not canceling first. <coughs> can result in having to work with large numbers, which may be mistakes. Now, our numbers are big. We're working with the numbers 100 and 210. Whereas here, I never worked with a number larger than 35. Now, again, these numbers are very nice. They were both divisible by 10 and, and now all that. But uh, you could end up in a case where if you just straight up just start multiplying out everything, you end up with two monster expressions here that is more complicated to then factor afterwards. Um, so while this isn't wrong, I would kind of discourage just indiscriminately applying the, the first rule that comes to your mind. You kind of want to start simplifying a little bit before you start actually combining. Um, and that's, uh, that's, a general, that's a general term. Uh, maybe I should just express that. Try to simplify before trying to combine. And this is just a recommendation. It's not because it's the only way to do it correctly, but it tends to be more efficient and less errors. If you're all computers, it wouldn't matter at all, but you're all human beings. So I can tell you from experience, when human beings try to do it this way, a lot of errors happen. When they do it this way, they tend to get through okay. Any questions on that? Do you understand the distinction here? Yeah, look, a very simple problem, but you can get a lot of lessons out of it. This is, this is what I mean when, when you're studying. I don't just want you to, oh, well, I see that this can cancel and I get this, and then you move on. No, go back to the problem and think, 
what could I have learned here? Was there another way to do it? What was efficient about what I did? What was inefficient about what I did? You look at this form that you get went through in homework and you try to see what lessons did going through that example actually teach me? What did I come away with? When you start thinking on that level, that brings you into the situation where, one, it gets into the language center of your brain easier because now you're starting to talk about the math in English expressions, right? Which helps your cognitive ability. Did I tell you guys about that podcast? Words? I think I did. Yeah. Language is very important to cognition. Whenever, you're la whenever you have a language disconnect, the subject matter becomes harder to understand just automatically, right? Um, so you really want to, if you want to get really good at something, it turns out you actually also want to get really good at talking about that thing. The more you can talk about that thing, the deeper and better your understanding about that thing is going to be. Once you learn to talk about mathematics, your math skills will go up automatically without you even practicing anything. Just making it closer to your language actually makes it a lot easier to actually digest. So sometimes you want to look at a problem that you actually did using ruthless computations, and then you look at the qualitative aspect of it. What was easy about this? What strategy could I learn? That sort of thing. Right? This is very important. So when you're going through homework or any, any kind of studying, always set aside some time to afterwards actually look at all the problems you did, what were the lessons these guys were trying to teach you. Right? And yeah, if you can't find those lessons, which if you're not used to actually doing this kind of studying, you probably will you scratch it. I don't know what it's trying to show me. I just, I just did it. Yeah, you come talk to me, you come talk to uh, someone else in the tutoring center, and they, they can explain to you what the point of those examples were, what they were trying to teach you. Um, it's very important that you're able to study and figure that out. Um, then what will happen is this strange thing. Math would start to feel a lot more natural, if I can, if I dare say that, that phrase. You know, some people, they see a math problem, they really have to think, what is it that's supposed to be done here? What did you want to do that time in class? And some people just, they see it and they just kind of intuitively know what to do. You want to be that person who can do math on intuition? This is where you should be focusing your attention. The better you get at this kind of thought process, the more intuitive your math is going to be. A lot of, a lot of info from a very simple problem. Don't, er don't underestimate the simple problem. I promise you, for this class and many, many math classes beyond this, every time you get stuck on a big problem, the real reason that you got stuck is there's a simpler problem that you don't understand that feeds into that larger problem. All your big problems are just combinations of smaller problems. Really understand the small problems and the big ones are easy. Yeah. Which a lot of times you hear these people talking about, uh, you know, if you have a major goal, you split it up into sub goals and all that kind of thing. That's a very mathematical way to think, right? Here's a big problem. No, what are the smaller problems? That's how you, you, you attack the smaller problems first. Suddenly the big problem doesn't seem so intimidating anymore. Okay, what do we do here? Mm -hmm. All right. Four goes into twelve three times. So that would be left over with three times, yeah. Well, it's negative three if I put it to the top. I'm just actually canceling here. <laughs> yeah. Then if I divide the x cubed into the y to the fifth, what's left over is y squared. Uh, the 5 can go into the 25 by 5 times. So what do we actually have left over here? There's a 1 over a 1 times five a 5y squared over 3x cubed. Right? And it turns out that that's actually the answer. Now you can multiply across. At this point, there's nothing else to cancel. We already did all the canceling. Take it out, so the x plus 
like cancer now. It's so weird. So yeah, you see, uh, let me just stop you there. He saw the rational expressions. What was his knee-jerk reaction? Let's see if I can cancel things. What? How do I get to cancel things? I factor. So he immediately start factoring. He looks at the top. Oh, there are two terms. Must be a difference of squares. So he tries difference of squares. Works out. Of course, this is a very familiar problem. Very familiar statement, so you kind of know this automatically. Tries to factor this. Well, that's a GCF factor. That's the first thing you'd actually look for. And this <coughs> can't factor, that can't factor, at least not in a nicer way. Now, what you can do is you can start canceling here. You can cancel things in the bottom with things in the top. So that goes away. And now you multiply the remaining ones. So that's 2 times x minus 3 over 1. So multiplying is nice. Uh, you can even start canceling before you combine. And I would say whenever you're trying to actually simplify a problem, trying to simplify as early as possible is probably uh, a good thing. Simplify, so we're automatically thinking, factoring, and cancel. So, uh, by thinking, factoring, what can I do here? <coughs> GCF, there's a common term. What's the common term? to learn the lesson at this point because you're not really going to see the benefit, but I'm going to tell you there's a lot of benefit to do with something like this. Now, sometimes when you have a complicated expression like this, what you'll notice is some of the things are going to factor painfully easily. Some of the other things are going to have to think a little bit. Now, yes, I know you don't have to think much for these two, but understand the principle of what I'm trying to show you. Um, factoring these was cl is clearly going to be harder than it was factoring those. But here's the thing. Normally when we give you a problem in a class, Right, you're in a very controlled environment, so it's not going to be very chaotic. You should expect that things are going to cancel. And what that means is your guesses as to how to factor this is going to be informed by the things that you've already factored. Right? So let, let me show you what that's going to be. So if I'm 3y times y plus 3 times 2y times y plus 2 over, now here I have 2y, and I'm going to think Okay, now I have to factor these. Now, <coughs> because I see a y plus 3 and a y plus 2, and I see that the last digit here is 2, I'm thinking, Javon wants me to cancel something. So there's probably a y plus 2 here. Right? You just throw that guess out there, because you kind of see it's going to be advantageous to the position, uh, situation. And then what you do, so this is a, was purely a guess based on what was going on elsewhere in the environment. Right? So, right? And then what I'm going to do, and this especially is useful when you're, you're in a method that you might need trial and error or like the AC method or something more complicated. What you can do is you can just do a little guess and then try to see what you would actually need to get that work, what would I need to get this to work out.
You'll see this uh, in more detail when I do more complicated problems. Get the guests to work out. Well, now I start thinking, what would I actually need to get this to work out? Well, if I want the number here to be 2, uh, this should be 2. If I want the number here to be a 2, then what should the number here be? It has to be the 1, right? It has to be a plus 1 for this to be a 2. And of course, if this is going to be a y squared, that has to be a y. And then what you can do is you can check after the fact. Does this actually work out? If I take the product of these two, I get 2y, plus the product of those two, I get 1y. 2y plus 1y equals 3y. So I see the factoring actually works out. Now, I know you could have done this, but I'm saying in situations where it would be slightly more complicated, what you can do is you can throw out a guess, figure out what you'd have to do to make the guess work out. A lot of times it's going to work out because the whole point of me asking you this question is to see if you can factor and cancel stuff. So chances are I'm going to give you things that are going to cancel nicely. So you can kind of game the system. This is uh, not really a general uh, uh, advice for life, but it's more of a general advice for how tests actually work. Right? If I'm giving you this and telling you to simplify, chances are things are going to cancel. So you can kind of use that anticipation to your advantage. So same thing with over here. Now I know that this is a, it's going to break up like that. Now. You know that there are many ways that you can actually break up the 12, right? Could be 2 and 6, could be 3 and 4. And because I saw that the 2 is already taking your note here, and I see the y plus 3, 3 and 4 is probably going to be the right guess. So I'm going to guess that there's a y plus 3 in that factory. Now, if that's a 3, what would this have to end up being to, in order to make that? Well, that would have to be y plus 4. And then you can check, does that actually work? 3y and 4y, yeah, make 7 y. So when I have options here, it could be a 1 and a 12, or a 2 and a 6, or a 3 and a 4. The 3 and a 4 was the right guess, given the context of what was going on. Right? So it can actually narrow down your guesses, right? which is what I'm trying to say. You can kind of use that to gain the system a little bit. Yeah? Um, you can also, to save from passing to divide by 2y, you expression. Yes, we could have done that right here. But I, I, I do want to see uh, this kind of idea. No, I mean the right. The denominator is the first problem? No. The denominator, just divided by 2y. What do you mean divided by 2y? Divide each um, term. By oh, you can't actually do that. That would be I still like the same thing. No, just by dividing the denominator by 2y? Like each term. And and then what did you do? I just I got y squared plus three y plus two. Okay, but well, what about the two y that's here? Um. Right. You need that y <coughs> to kill that. <coughs> yeah. So th that's going to be a thing. Remember, whenever we're looking at fractions, and there's no equal sign. You can't just do something without a consequence, right? If you're going to divide this by 2y, you would also have to divide the top by 2y at the same time. That way you're multiplying by 1 over 2y by 1 over 2y, you're not changing the value. But if I give you a random fraction, you can't just divide apart because you feel like it, right? I mean, if I give you 3 over 4, you can't just, I feel like dividing the denominator by 2. Then it becomes 3 over 2. It's a completely different thing, right? You can't just randomly decide to affect one part of a fraction without expecting some consequence. So don't, uh, don't end up in that situation. If this were an equal sign, what I could do is I could divide both sides by 2y. Right? Without that equal sign, this is not an option. Okay? So be careful how you're affecting things. I, I know you want to simplify this right away by dividing things out, but you can't really get that done. Uh, you want to think factor. So when you want to simplify rational expressions, especially in the case that you don't have an equal sign, don't think divide, don't think add, don't think expand, don't think any of that. Think factor. You always want to think factor. OK, so now that we have that, uh, we can start canceling people. This kills that. This kills that. This kills that. Who survives? No way. Right? <laughs> this 3y times the 1. 
And then on the denominator, I have the y plus 1 surviving, and I have the y plus 1. All right. Let's see what else do I have? Again, the rules of fraction applies, which means to divide, you take the value you're divided by, you flip it, and you multiply it. So I'm not going to go over that. I guess I jump to the examples. And if there are any lessons to learn, I shall point them out. Here we have a little bit more. Three more examples, so let's start with those. Mnemonic so that they feel like they have this, like, you know, I have some insider information here. <laughs> it's like, keep change, no, just keep change the flip, bro. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. I learned another thing by accident. Did, maybe this is did, Does anyone know what that means? Isn't that like an app? Yeah. You, you know what that means? Visco. 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 Like, I, I, never, I never found out about that until, like, yesterday. Like, what is this? I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> wow, so I'm here teaching you important math and that's what everyone's curious about. How do I do this now? This? So, okay, easy. Moving on. Yeah, now everyone's woken up. Good. <laughs> Let's focus now. <laughs> well, we know we're going to do the key change, but then let's first. Okay, so what do we do here? Which is? X plus J, this one. 2X is a common <coughs> term. This one.
So now, anything simplifies? Yeah, text plus text plus text. This? Nothing else, right? So that's x squared plus 3x, well, x plus 1 times x squared. Over 6x squared times x plus 2. this out there, um, but yeah, we, we're not going to invent something because just to get something to work out. That, that's the simplest that that can be. Which I've seen. I've seen students just be like, you know what, I'm, a, I'm going to invent, invent this math right here <laughs> so that this thing becomes nice because I feel like Javon wants it to be nice. So. <coughs> yeah, we obey the rules. Okay, so that's, that's the simplest we can get this one. So for C, we're going to have a cube minus b cube over 2a squared plus 5ab plus 2b squared times, we're going to flip and multiply, big guy. Big guy. Okay, what are you thinking? Oh my god. <laughs> okay. What's the second thing you're thinking? Right. This reminds you of a, a, a formula, right? Times? Also, this is pretty easy to factor. There's a common factor of 4 in here. Now, what's probably causing some concern are the denominators. Uh, we could do something with this one, though. 2a is in every one. Is that it? And then we left over with? Okay. Now, what about over here? <coughs> now, here's where I'm going to throw in my guess, see if it works out. You know what? I see a 2a squared here, and here I see a 2a plus b. You know, I'm going to guess that there's going to be a 2a plus b here and an a here, right? Now, to get that uh, b, uh, to get back this here, which is uh, 2b squared, what does this need to be? It needs to be 2b, right? So this was, this was my guess, and this is my reaction to that guess. That has to work. Now what I do is I actually check, does this work out? Multiply the two first numbers, I get the two first numbers. Multiply the two last numbers, I get the two last numbers. Multiply the outer ones, I get uh, 4AB. Multiply the inner ones, I get 1AB. 4AB plus 1AB gives me the 5AB, so that was the factor. So now I just, uh, I just basically did trial and error, but my guesses were very restricted now because I'm just seeing what else is going on in the environment. Always be aware of your surroundings. That's the life lesson here, right? Sometimes you know certain actions. You 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 know you, you watch what's going on, and then you know how to act. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I'm doing here. I I know that something should be factoring. That's my knee jerk reaction. So if I see something's gonna really work out nicely, I just like throw it in, react to it, and see does does it actually validate what the assumption was in the first place. So that actually works out, and what happens here? Okay, this is now like that. This actually cancels with that. The two cancels into the four to leave another two. Anything else? I think that's it. So in the top, what do I have left over? The two and the a minus b. Here. A and A plus 2B. That's it. You can't redo anything. So doing this thing, just kind of guessing based on the surroundings. Um, of 
course, there are other ways to do it. You could just straight up learn the the, do the technique that I showed you last time, but this will save off a couple seconds off each problem and be able to do things like that. And in a test, it might add up. Whatever you can do to kind of ease your cognitive stress, it actually pays off. I guess synergistically. So you save a two, a, a, a 30 seconds here and there, but that in turn boosts your confidence because now you're getting through things easier. It makes it easier for you to see solutions to other things than panic and freak out. What is this going to look like here? Minus 8. 
And so this is going to look like x what? Minus 4. Minus 4. Minus 4. Yeah. Uh, we'd have to probably clean this up a bit, uh, but in the meantime, I guess I can start. It's not the same. Let's do that. Um, what would I have here? Well, x plus 2 times x squared minus 4. And that's the difference of squares times uh, x minus 3 over x minus 4 times x plus 2. So, so I can realize that is this is actually uh, x minus 2, x plus 2. And then, uh, yeah, this cancels that. This cancels that. That's it. x plus 2, x minus 3, or x minus 4. So this uh, is organized as 5 times x squared minus 4. So I can do 5 times x minus 2 times x plus 2. So okay, cancel this, cancel that, cancel this, cancel that. Now try these, just keep in mind that the old rules of fractions work. Want to get really good at these guys here. Oh, more examples.